In this video, we're going to talk about triggers for nausea and vomiting, as well as some of the common antiemetics that we may prescribe or uh, provide for nausea and vomiting, and how they will interact with different types of nausea and vomiting. So the first thing that we're going to do to define nausea and vomiting or how it works is outline the nucleus tractus solitarius, which is going to be a key component in the initiation of nausea and vomiting. So often we'll talk about a nausea and vomiting center or the nausea and vomiting center, which lives in the medulla. This is really a complex cluster of neurons that can trigger nausea and vomiting with the nucleus tractus solitarius playing a large role in this. So we, we want to picture this as essentially a cluster of neurons um, that is going to receive a number of pieces of information from different sources that then can fire or, or send, uh, genera, genera, generate a central pattern that can actually lead to nausea and vomiting. So this is our nucleus tractus solitarius. And it's going to play an important role in our nausea and vomiting uh, system and is going to play a, an important role in the, in the nausea and vomiting center um, by allowing us to generate patterns of, of nerve responses that can lead to nausea and vomiting. So when we look at, well, what sends signals to our nucleus tractus solitarius? There are a ton of different things that can um, trigger this area of the brain to stimulate nausea and vomiting. One occurs centrally at we call what we call the chemoreceptor trigger zone. The chemoreceptor trigger zone lives at the base of the fourth ventricle, so where our, it basically makes a connection between our brainstem and our cerebral spinal fluid. Uh, where we can identify uh, essentially uh, chemicals uh, or uh, toxic uh, toxins that can lead to nausea and vomiting. So we're looking at our chemoreceptor trigger zone here. And that is going to live at the base of the fourth ventricle, so where our cerebral spinal fluid is going to live. So uh, that's our chemoreceptor trigger zone. And our chemoreceptor trigger zone, importantly, has uh, serotonin receptors that live on it. So this chemoreceptor trigger zone has uh, 5-HT3, or serotonin receptors on it. And it will send signals to the vomiting center or the nucleus tractus solitarius, um, again, to generate those central patterns that would end up leading to nausea and vomiting. So we can see signals will come from our... Uh, chemoreceptor trigger zone and can stimulate our nucleus tractus solitarius. There are a number of other uh, factors that can, can innervate into the nucleus tractus solitarius or the vomiting center and lead to vomiting. Uh, one of those is information from our cranial nerves. So when we look at our cranial nerves, especially those involved in taste, um, that can be a core trigger for uh, patients to end up with nausea and vomiting. So we can see a lot of our taste information being sent through our cranial nerves, so that we, uh, through our facial nerve, our glossal pharyngeal nerve, and our vagus nerve. So uh, cranial nerves 7, 9, and 10 are uh, going to promote uh, or send signals to the nucleus tractus solitarius, which can lead to nausea and vomiting. So we see signals coming into this area from our taste receptors, which can trigger the the uh, pattern generator to actually generate nausea and vomiting. Some of the other uh, areas where we are going to receive information from um, is our chemoreceptors and uh, that live within our uh, basically the efferents or the, the areas that are impacted by our vagus nerve. So a lot of that is going to be our GI system. So if we look at uh, the vagus nerve and the innervations of the vagus nerve, we can have chemoreceptors. Um, that are going to recognize toxins uh, externally that can send signals to our uh, nucleus tractus solitarius to trigger nausea and vomiting. So uh, vagal chemoreceptors will also send signals to the uh, NTS in order to trigger vomiting. So uh, we have uh, chemoreceptors that live actually outside of the brain or peripherally that can stimulate this vomiting center as well. So vagal chemoreceptors, the information from vagal chemoreceptors can lead to the stimulation of nausea vomiting. 
And then finally, we can get general uh, visceral afferent pathways from the GI tract, the pharynx and the palate. So we can get um, information from uh, chemically and mechanically sensitive neurons. So again, if we look at the amount of innervation of our GI system, the pharynx, the palate, we can get sensation from neurons that live in these areas that are uh, chemically or mechanically sensitive, which can trigger a patient to develop uh, nausea and vomiting. So uh, when we look at the GI system, and we'll, again, we've outlined the GI system here, but this is occurring also from the pharynx and the palate. Um, we're going to have uh, visceral afferents that are going to send uh, signals from those chemically or mechanically sensitive neurons. So when we're looking at peripheral stimulants, um, it can be vagal, vagal chemoreceptors, can be from our uh, taste receptors or the, the cranial nerves that are innervating the taste receptors, or we could have chemically or mechanically sensitive neurons in the periphery um, that are going to be able to send information through afferent nerve fibers uh, to the, the vomiting center. So a lot of different triggers for nausea and vomiting uh, coming from a lot of different areas. And you can see why there would need to be a central area to kind of uh, basically uh, co coagulate or, or uh, combine all of these signals in order to create nausea and vomiting. So just to recap, a number of different areas where we can trigger this nucleus tractus solitarius to stimulate nausea and vomiting. The chemoreceptor trigger zone, which lives centrally at the base of the fourth ventricle um, and has 5-HT3 uh, receptors, can send signals to the nucleus tractus uh, solitarius. We can have taste information coming from our facial, glossal, pharyngeal, and vagus nerve, and that information is being sent to the NTS. We have vagal chemoreceptors coming from the periphery that are uh, sending signals to the NTS, or we can have chemically or mechanically sensitive neurons that live in our periphery, so places like our GI tract, our pharynx, and our palate, which are also going to send impulses to this NTS. Importantly about this, um, the primary receptor that lives within here that is going to recept, uh, accept these impulses, again, are 5-HT3 receptors. Um, so we're looking at serotonin receptors that are being activated that are triggering these responses. Um, and then what happens from here is the NTS is going to send out, or a number of neurons within the NTS at the vomiting center are, are going to send out a pattern of nerve response which triggers emesis. Um, so they call, um, basically this area uh, is going to connect to an emetic central pattern generator or basically a cluster of neurons that live in this area that are gonna send a signal out that actually lead to nausea and vomiting. So from here, we get um, basically a cluster of neurons sending out a pattern of responses which are going to do a couple of things. Um, one, it's going to mediate the gag reflex. So the patient uh, may start gagging. So as you see this kind of central pattern being generated, gag reflex is one of them. We start to see an increase in GI motility. So we can see that reverse peristalsis, which can actually lead to nausea and vomiting. We can start to see an increase in GI secretions. And you can actually see relaxation of the pharynx and sphincters which is going to lead to the opening that allows for uh, vomit to actually exit. So those are some stimulations or some ways that we can stimulate uh, vomiting for patients. Uh, one of the other ways that we haven't yet talked about is through stimulation of the uh, vestibular cochlear system. Um, so as we know, we have a vestibular nuclei that lives within our brainstem that takes information from our ear and, and essentially the balance um, sen sensing sensors that live within our ear. So what we have up here is our labyrinth. So first we're seeing we've got the labyrinth. And the labyrinth will send information about uh, basically where we are in space and time. We'll send information about dizziness. Um, this is what can trigger, um, can trigger motion sickness for patients. And it sends that information to the vestibular nuclei that lives in the pons. So when we look at how does our, basically the function of our ear, the, the elements of our ear lead to potentially nausea, nausea and vomiting, well, that's coming from the labyrinth, which is going to send information from the labyrinth to the vestibular nuclei. So that's what we're looking at here. This is your vestibular nuclei.
it's going to receive information from uh, the labyrinth. So uh, we have information coming from the labyrinth that is headed towards the vestibular nuclei. And what's going to be bound to here, or where that, uh, where that signal gets sent, is to histamine receptors. So we have um, up here the primary receptor that's going to be involved in uh, nausea and vomiting is the histamine receptor. So H1 receptors are going to respond to impulses coming from the labyrinth to the vestibular nuclei. And then the vestibular nuclei will actually send um, a signal to the uh, the chemoreceptor trigger zone to lead to vomiting. So from the uh, vestibular nuclei, we have an impulse that goes to the chemoreceptor trigger zone, um, which can lead to the stimulation of nausea and vomiting. So when we look at what we can give or the medications we can give, we're going to talk about two particular medications here for nausea and vomiting. One is uh, uh, diamond hydronate, um, which is going to be Gravol. And that is a histamine uh, receptor blocker. So when we look at medications for uh, nausea and vomiting, one of the ones that we can give is diamond hydronate, which is going to be an H1 receptor blocker, so uh, blocks histamine receptors. And one of the challenges with this medication as an antiemetic is that it is going to uh, only block our histamine receptors or only act on our histamine receptors, which is really primarily good for nausea and vomiting. That is the result of uh, motion sickness or dizziness um, or nausea and vomiting that is, is be as a result of labyrinth stimulation of the vestibular nuclei. nuclei. So again, we're, when we're giving uh, diamond hydronate for nausea and vomiting, we're looking at a really specific type of nausea and vomiting uh, that we're targeting with diamond hydronate. One of the consequences of diamond hydronate is that as we block histamine receptors, we also have histamine receptors that live in the reticular activating system and the patient will end up being drowsy. So instead of actually fixing the nausea and vomiting that this patient has, the diamond hydronate, um, especially if it's not as a result of vestibular cochlear mechanism, the diamond hydronate will make the patient drowsy uh, and they may have CNS depression, which then can lead to uh, a, a lot, lack of nausea and vomiting. Alternatively, you can give a medication called Zofran or uh, Ondansteron, um, and it is going to be a serotonin receptor blocker. So the other medication we can consider here is uh, Ondansteron. Again, Ondansteron is going to block, or it's going to be a serotonin receptor blocker, or blocks our 5-HT3 uh, receptors. So blocks uh, serotonin receptors. And the benefit of this is it's going to block a number of receptors or uh, it's going to block uh, a number of areas that actually uh, are going to be involved in nausea and vomiting from a number of different sources. So we can block impulses that are coming into the nucleus tractus solitarius by blocking uh, 5-HT receptors that live in the nucleus tractus solitarius, that live in um, the areas where these vagal chemoreceptors live, where these uh, chemically and mechanically sensitive neurons live, can block the 5-HT receptors in our chemoreceptor trigger zone um, or to the input that's coming from our uh, cranial nerves. So on dance is going to have a more widespread effect on patients who are experiencing nausea and vomiting because we're going to do a better job at actually uh, reducing the innervation from either the kind of the central areas, so the chemoreceptor trigger zone that is going to send signals to the vomiting center, or from the peripheral areas, so things like, uh, again, our cranial nerves, vagal chemoreceptors, uh, chemically uh, or mechanically sensitive neurons. Uh, one of the other areas that we didn't mention that can lead to nausea and vomiting is our cortex. So the uh, stimulation of the cortex can actually lead to nausea and vomiting. So think about uh, things like sights, um, gruesome sights, thoughts um, can actually lead to nausea and vomiting as well. And these are doing that for the same mechanism. So this is another pathway that can actually stimulate that uh, nucleus tractus solitarius. So um, when we're giving something like uh, ondansteron, the benefit is that that ondansteron is going to block the serotonin receptors at a number of the areas that are going to be more commonly involved in uh, nausea and vomiting and can have uh, a kind of a greater effect. A couple cautions when giving something like uh, ondansteron. 
we can't uh, give it with apomorphine. It actually enhances the effects of apomorphine and can lead to further hypotension and CNS depression. So when endosterone is given in combination with apomorphine, the patients will usually experience profound hypotension. Uh, so it has a potentiating effect on the apomorphine. Uh, so just be cautious uh, in those settings. Endosterone has also been shown to increase the QT interval or can, or can increase the QT interval in rare instances. So patients who have prolonged QT interval should not be uh, being administered uh, on endosterone. Otherwise, when we're looking at causes of nausea and vomiting, endosterone is typically our leader when we're looking at causes outside of vestibular reasons. So outside of things like motion sickness, endosterone is typically a more successful antiemetic and actually uh, inhibiting uh, the features that actually lead to, uh, to emesis. I hope this helps. Thank you.